This is Duke University. All right, well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome, thanks for being here today. Uh, this is our final session of Duke's inaugural Global Career Week. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hal Matthews and I'm an Associate Director for Global Careers with Duke's Career Center. Uh, this week, we've held a number of workshops and sessions dedicated to exploring opportunities and career pathways around the world. And I'm particularly excited for today's talk on emerging opportunities for Duke students in India because I regularly meet with students who are interested in exploring opportunities in India, but are not sure where to start. So luckily, we have a particularly distinguished speaker here today to share his valuable insights with us. Uh, before I introduce him, I would like to give a special thanks to our co-sponsor, uh, the Duke India Initiative, and in particular, Rohini Thakkar, who has been instrumental in helping organize this event. So thank you, Rohini. And I'm honored to introduce Lalit Mahadeshwar, a distinguished business and community leader based right here in the Triangle. Lalit is an experienced technology professional and executive with over 20 years of diverse global corporate, governmental, and entrepreneurial experience across telecom, pharmaceuticals, B2B, B2C, and tech startups. Lalit is the founder of the Sateri Group of Companies, one of the first virtual companies with a talent pool of small and medium-sized enterprises from around the world. He has successfully executed multi-million dollar projects in almost every continent for Soteri Systems Inc., as well as other reputed organizations. He's also the founder of Iratech India Technology Private Limited, a subsidiary specializing in biometrics-based solutions for India's national social security numbers, employing iris-based identification for its vast population. As president of the Hindu Society of North Carolina, Lalit helps oversee a network of over 30 nonprofit organizations in the state. He is also president of India 321, a global nonprofit organization dedicated to collaborating with stakeholders interested in India's emergence as a developed nation. Lalit's many contributions have been recognized with the North Carolina State Governor's Award for Human Services in 2023. Lalit has kindly taken some time out of his obviously very busy schedule to help us understand current economic trends in India, to highlight key sectors with emerging employment opportunities in India, and to answer your questions. So Lalit, I can't thank you enough for being here and I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Hal. Uh, uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, thank you all the Duke uh, Institutes and Rohini especially for giving me this opportunity to talk with these young people, young minds. And it's brilliant to be there. I always love to be in Duke facility. Whenever I get a chance, I do come there, you know, like in Duke Gardens, as well as your cafeteria. Uh, so I'm excited uh, to meet with some of you folks. And uh, I'm glad if I can contribute, I'll keep my lectures pretty brief. Um, I have put in some slides together so we can kind of be pointed, but I can share my data whenever, if anybody is interested and uh, I will open it up for question answers so we can have interactive sessions wherever anybody has any specific concerns or questions, we can address them in a better manner. All right, so first of all, you know, like when I heard that, you know, like uh, there is this kind of a lecture where career opportunities in India is being offered to Duke students. My wife uh, told me like, you know, like what, like why would Duke students want to go to India? And uh, I said, just because they're smart, they're intelligent. So they know and they probably do their research, right? So just to tell you, like, it's kind of, you know, like I'm working from US here in Raleigh and I have multiple, uh, you know, like labs in India, which I govern. And one of the thing which really kind of, you know, like make me jealous is I have to sometimes get up like last week, every day I've been getting up and getting into meeting at five o'clock in the morning. And I have to catch up people, particularly with a lot of working mothers. I have to be there early so that they can go home early and I can catch up with them. So a lot of new executives, uh, which I make me wake up early, but here, we are used to four or five bank holidays primarily in a year, mainly. And in India, we have Saturday, Sunday off, which they have copied from US and European culture. 
And on top of it, in the state of Maharashtra, where most of my offices are, they have like last year they had 24 official bank holidays. So what you know you can imagine that the, the perk is like having these official holidays, bank holidays, and have fun. You can explore the country, you can take it easy. So it's much easier to work there. And that might be the one of the incentives why these Duke students are looking for some opportunities there. I don't know, but we'll see. We will rather ask them if that's what motivated them. Uh, firstly, I'm assuming some of you might not know India and the current position India is having. So let me kind of you know, give you a little bit of a brief background of India. India is a pretty diverse country. It is a huge country, uh, not as big as probably Russia or China or US uh, in geography, but significantly large landmass. And it has like 1.42 billion people. Uh, it's largest populous country in the world now, uh, surpassing China recently. It's made up of 28 states and union territories. So it's very diverse it's as well as kind of going to a European continent and seeing the difference between neighboring states like, you know, countries like England and the Great Britain and France and Germany and how diverse the culture is, how different the languages are. Exactly same thing you'll find in India. India has like, you know, close to 25, I think 24 official languages and 25 different scripts. So one of the first thing you'll notice landing on any of the airport in India is when you exchange a currency, your currency note will have multiple languages and scripts which describe what the currency stands for. So that's the kind of diversity. It's a cultural shock uh, for many people who probably coming there in India for the first time to see that kind of a diversity. So it's a very diverse country. It has a, a, like a you know, civilization which dates back to thousands of years old. And uh, it uh, has their own calendars, languages, geographical conditions. Uh, we have the highest mountains, Himalayas, as well as deserts and big uh, ocean fronts. So sea line, shoreline. So it's pretty diverse country, different cuisines, uh, food is different, language is different, festivals different, people follow different calendars. It's truly, truly diverse nation. So. Putting everything about India in one particular frame of mind is always difficult. Uh, but I think like, you know, like uh, it's still is a very interesting and that's what makes it very colorful country. And it still attracts many people from all over the world just to see this diversity and history of humankind to be there. The majority of, you know, like companies or MNCs which are now going to India they are getting excited because of this particular group. If you look at it, you know, this group of a, you know, people who are teenager from 15 to 24 years, there's two, 232 million people there. And the other working class population is almost like 550 million. So if you combine, we're talking about like almost double the size of uh, population of US as a working population in India. So we have like, you know, like almost twice the number of people who are of a working age and that kind of, you know, that workforce attracts many of the people. That's where the workforce is. And that's what is attracting many of the folks, uh, many of the companies, multinational companies to India. So this is what I think is the primary attraction point which is taking many of the companies to India and it ha India has its own potential which people are kind of talking about. Uh, some other factors which, which I think would be interesting to note is you know the GDP that's making news like it's 3.73 trillion dollar economy is significantly growing consistently. There's a long way to go compared to many of the advanced countries but it's still in the top five and it's growing at 7.4% uh, last year and consistently, you know, like that. In, I think you can notice that some of these 
in 2020 because of uh, COVID, the epidemic, uh, it was negative as like most of the world, but it jumped back significantly again. So that's something which is definitely to be noticed. Uh, it has also improved significantly in last couple of decades, I would say, where uh, India started growing pretty significantly. Um, and, you know, with a determination of kind of, you know, making sure that they find the employment for these young people who are growing up. Uh, you can see that, you know, like the ease of doing business in 2014 has been improved drastically from almost 142 uh, rank to 63 in 2020, and I'm sure it has been improving. So some of the uh, bureaucratic hurdles, which I still feel that they are significant, but have drastically reduced. Uh, the government is becoming more and more business friendly compared to what it was. So it's all I'm talking about in comparison, but still, you know, I've been doing business in many countries all over the world. So comparatively, uh, in the developing world, India has improved significantly well in last few, you know, like a decade or two. Um, and it has shown consistent improvement in uh, improving the business score. Um, the stock market is performing really good. 58.28 uh, in five years is, of course, pretty good. Now, I'm not considering the dollar rate here. Uh, I'm not considering it from the people who are probably investing into in dollars in India, but for within India, it's significantly it's kind of averaging 18% per annum. So for local industry or local investor, it's very bullish market and it's consistently has been bullish over a decade. So it is significantly good. It has come out of uh, recessions very nicely because of its inherent strength of domestic market. So it is kind of, you know, scoring pretty well. Um, now, this is something which is, you know, like very interesting. And that's where probably will be the interest of most of you would like. The online buyer number, if you look at the buyers, it's growing so quickly uh, because of the penetration of 5G. Most of the India now has the 5G network and the poorest of poor has an access to a smartphone with a 5G network because it's pretty cheap there. It's uh, literally like we are talking about like four or five dollars per month. Uh, and a, a worker who is living away from his family, um, a blue collar worker or a hawker can still have a phone. And, you know, like I see really um, the smile on their face when they're early in the morning, late in the evening, when they're traveling back home, they can talk to their dear ones in their native places and they can communicate with the face to, you know, like face to face conference. So this particular market is huge and it's growing rapidly. There's tremendous potential in this online buyers, which is going to cut down a lot of bureaucracy, which is going to cut down many layers, which have been traditionally existed uh, in the logistic and supply chain. Those will be drastically coming down. So online market or online business in India is going to be pretty huge uh, scenario. And the number is still in a very nascent form. When they achieve this, it will be still, you know, like you can see here, it's only 10%. So there is a tremendous scope of growth of doubling this size almost every year in upcoming years. So this is something which I felt is really kind of an interesting thing. Uh, in US dollars, it's like around 150 billion market. And this we're talking about only in India. And it's rising by 10% a year. Uh, sorry, it's 10% of the total sales. So it's kind of, you know, there's a tremendous scope to grow here. So this is something which, you know, you need to know that there is a huge potential in why people are talking. I don't know, meaning I do follow the work, uh, World Economic Forum quite uh, with interest. And this time, like India was featuring pretty heavily, it was getting attention. And most of the people were talking about IOTs and other things and some of the politics in the US, but that's what their concern was. But India stood, you know, like was making pretty big news with its infrastructure growth and many of the growth potentials in the economy. So these are some of the numbers which probably would attract many of the companies there. Um, yeah, we can talk about it. Why, why, when I see that, I must uh, kind of, you know, 
uh, probably share some of these India's concerns with you. Um, there is still, because of the size and the scale and the diversity, it still has a lot of strides to be made. There are a lot of, a lot of work need to be done in many of these areas. Um, corruption index, uh, it's perception index, and I, I don't know the validity of this. I don't want to uh, comment in, on you know, like how much accurate these are, but general perception as a businessman doing business regularly, I think there has been a good, you know, a significant improvement in recent years in a day-to-day -day, uh, government practices or exposure. A lot of dig digitization, um, you know, has eased out quite a lot of procedures. Uh, many of the business deals by government tenders and all are now online. So that has been like a pretty significant change. Uh, it's a long, long way to go. Let me... Uh, you know, like I must con con uh, confess that, you know, there is there's still a long way to go. It's still coming out of, uh, you know, the previous um, traditional systems, which because of the overpopulation, there has been a uh, major scope of corruption, which has been exploited. Uh, but there has been a lot of uh, improvements in recent years. And the average human uh, index, which considers the human values, the education, the health, the uh, sanitary conditions, the po pollution, uh, the standard of living, that is pretty low, I would say, significantly low if you consider the average uh, Indian population. It is significantly low compared to the developing countries. So that's something which you need to understand. Uh, it still has, it, despite of significant improvement and tremendous work, uh, throughout the last 70, 75 years, um, the illiteracy rate is still 20%. So significant amount of that, you know, like probably uh, 1.42 1 billion people, 20% of people are still not able to go to the schools and get education or get literate. So that's significant number. Uh, the World Economic Forum, again, uh, you know, gave these numbers recently, it shows that, you know, like almost 145 million people are below poverty line. So there is significant poverty in India uh, still. And when I say for below poverty line, it's like less than $2 a day uh, income for a household. So that's significantly poor um, uh, population. And that kind of increases the desperation. But I must say that, you know, compared to many other countries which have been as a tourist or as a business person, the crime rate is significantly low um, compared to other things. There are, you know, the law and order is not that great, but at the same time, the population is uh, not uh, violent enough or, you know, like the crime rate generally is pretty low. So that these are some of the concerns which you need to know uh, before you make any decisions or uh, if, if you want to take a career path in India, you need to know some of these numbers and be aware of it. But do investigate before you go there. Hard eye. So what is the, you know, like this consumer market, why we are interested and why a person, a very intelligent person who is paying pretty top dollars and getting admitted, competing with tens of thousands of people uh, into uh, superb universities like Duke should consider this opportunity. So one of the things which attracts this huge population is this particular sector, the rising affluence. Uh, probably, you know, I was in Hong Kong. I, I was living in Hong Kong for quite some time in 90s, late 90s, and I noticed growth of China uh, firsthand. And I could see how Shenzhen, when I visited Shenzhen first and recently two, three years back, uh, when I visited Shenzhen again, uh, how different it is, drastically different, the landscape has changed. And that's what is kind of, you know, appealing to most of the people, how much these people, this population is going to make impact and their growing needs are going to create many, many opportunities for all of us. So this is where I would like to draw your attention. Look at these numbers, you know, like from 2016 to 2025, the elite class has been raised from 12 to 20%. 
and 15 to 20 percent is the affluent class. And these are significantly pretty good, uh, good strong numbers because the buying power of rupees is much uh, probably at par with, uh, you know, compared to the Indian standards, these numbers are uh, pretty significantly comparable with US dollars. And we can consider this growing number of 40% of elite and affluent people going forward as a consumer equivalent to probably the average American uh, house, household. So this is a significantly big number that, you know, probably larger than the entire population of US, which will have the parity of buying parity or the income parity as that of US population. So that is where I would like you to know. There is a huge number of aspirants. And then of course there is, you know, like these all numbers, which are pretty big, which probably can, you know, like uh, be potentially a great market for the kind of product, whatever you have in your mind as a startup or as an innovative, I guess this is significantly big market. It's also kind of, you know, like when there are other factors like, you know, rising affluence and the urbanization. Now this urbanization is making, you know, like there are, when I left India, there were only four big metros. And to be honest, like, and maybe I'm biased, but uh, the Mumbai, you know, or Bombay, uh, as it used to be called in British era, um, was like, I would say like at par with international level in 90s uh, and the rest of the towns were not that big you know they were the cities they were big in size but they were the infrastructure didn't match but now if i go to class b cities as i used to know them when i was growing up in india the infrastructure has grown so much there are a lot of new cities which has you know cities like pune hyderabad bangalore have significantly made strides and you know like now they are par with many of the infrastructure, the airports are at par with international airports and, and they have significantly grown. So this urbanization or the population which is moving towards the cities is growing and that is of course creating huge need for infrastructure. There is a lot of projects, you know, there are probably um, multiple projects happening in multiple cities simultaneously for metro trains. Uh, there is bullet train, uh, which is happening, you know, like uh, being laid from um, in a collaboration with Japanese government. There is, you know, there are many airports which are opening up, like almost every year there are more airports are, uh, entering. So if you look at aviation, if you look at transportation, um, high end infrastructure, there's huge investment happening here. There's plenty of scope. Um, big cities are like, you know, like they're having. 100 and 150 storied buildings now. So most of these structure engineering work is coming here in US and a lot of scope happening because of the infrastructure. Big highways are being laid. A lot of things are happening here because of that. There is a other demand for, you know, like the nucleus families, which are kind of, you know, traditional family structure is waking up. That means that there are, more households, uh, more people are having their own families, their needs are, the consumption patterns are changing, their uh, spending is changing drastically, it's growing drastically. Uh, a lot of new elements, of course, when they don't have elderly parents to take care of their young ones, they are have to hire, um, you know, like the babysitters or, you know, crushes, they will need to put uh, children into the uh, childcare facilities. Uh, probably education, tutoring, all, all kinds of industries are growing because of this. Also, the geriatric care for the elderly people, a lot of different uh, needs are kind of coming in place, which were not there seen like probably 10 years back. Those are the sectors which are growing drastically. So huge uh, indicators, I think like these three indicators are kind of, you know, like uh, are making big difference and opening many, many business opportunities for many companies to consider. And a lot of people are doing that. A lot of companies are doing that. So uh, the other reasons why traditionally India attracted, uh, you know, like uh, the many countries or entrepreneurs, many companies or entrepreneurs is the natural resource. It has, it's very rich natural uh, in natural resources, plenty of metals, 
plenty of things. Uh, agriculture products is still kind of, you know, like highest production in many of the agriculture sectors. Uh, it's huge population and still, you know, it's manages to feed most of its people very well and export a lot of uh, ingredients. So a lot of uh, natural resources, plenty of natural resources, which can be tapped into um, a very low cost labor market. So that's another thing which attracts uh, many of the people, anything which is uh, labor oriented, which kind of, you know, like uh, uh, which needs the uh, skilled labor, but very cheap labor. Um, uh, India is an attraction point for that. Um, I'm kind of, you know, like putting uh, some conditions here, you know, like uh, where there is a diverse industries which are getting attractive. You see the basic metals and textiles are looking for the natural resources and low cost labor. At the same time, you have pharmaceuticals here, the technology products, the pharmaceuticals and the renewable energy and chemical products, which needs a very high skill labor force. And that is also available. So if you are an inventor, if you have some patents, if you have some ideas, you can still get chemical engineers and, you know, like a lot of technology workers or people to work in pharmaceutical workforce. And there is plenty of that available uh, there. There's a market for, you know, clinical research, you know, a huge uh, number of people, workers are available to set up uh, your shops there. Um, I think that, and the domestic market, of course, like that is like, uh, you know, if you want to tap into domestic markets, then that might be the best way to get in. I think Tesla is doing that. If they want to uh, start uh, tap the domestic market, so they are opening up plants there so that they can start selling it uh, in the Indian big market and start producing things in India, um, cars in India. So that's these are the kind of things which are probably attracting many of the industries in India. Uh, again, you know, like uh, these are some of the areas which where you can focus in and see if you can fit in in any of this or you want to tap any of these for a variety of careers uh, those are the things which can attract nation high tech uh, huge investment happening in silicon fabs iot and artificial intelligence in india at all levels um, definitely they need skill sets from all over the world um, you know like and they are actively recruiting many people Defense is a very big uh, kind of industry and it's growing tremendously way beyond uh, uh, traditional industry scale. And there's a lot of cooperation. I'm, I'm going to talk in detail about defense. But in education and research, there's a plenty of research happening in all the levels. And they're tapping a lot of these research institutes for a variety of high-tech fields. Of course, uh, there are many satellites being shown, the, uh, the um, air uh, aerodynamics and many of the latest uh, infrastructural uh, things. There are chemicals and pharmaceutical incentives. There is a lot of trademarks and IP rights being filed in India. So there are plenty of things which are happening in the research uh, field, which can be tapped into by, you know, like uh, by the US universities and the academicians. Uh, a huge scope for this young generation which need to get highly, you know, high quality education, they need um, better education. And there is a big scope for um, educators, like people who can train them, transfer the knowledge or groom them. So people who are specialized can, and want to pursue their career in research or in education, there's tremendous scope and people are willing to pay the US salaries to take them there. Uh, I am, uh, I know for sure that many of the people, professors, my friends here in Duke or UNC Chapel Hill, they travel multiple times in a year to India to give lectures and kind of, uh, you know, be part of their staff. Um, finance is another uh, industry, which is kind of, you know, like India is definitely making a lot of stride. Uh, Fintech is one industry where I would say that, you know, India is probably a little ahead of the rest of the world in terms of Fintech uh, implementation. And the advantage they have is, of course, you know, like the biometric um, identification, the entire population of 1.4 billion, most of them, 95 plus percent of them is now having a biometric identification and their bank accounts and most of it is linked together. 
So for majority of our populace or a huge section of populace, there are a variety of fintech products which are now available, which are not there compare, compared to the rest of the world. There is there's pretty big uh, development which is happening very rapidly in this industry. Of course, as I mentioned, you know, like there are a lot of new airports being built, roads, highways are being built, high rises are being built. Many of the theaters or colleges, universities, <coughs> all that needs um, people with experience in structural engineering, you know, like, and that is, uh, you know, like uh, India right now do not have most of the projects which have seen the architecture and structural engineering has been given out to companies in Europe and US. So a lot of opportunities in this area, uh, which probably people may not be aware of, but most of these opportunities and contracts do go to American companies and US, you know, uh, European companies. So huge scope of new architecture, you know, as India is expanding, most of that money is coming to US. Healthcare and pharmaceuticals, again, you know, there is clinical research and data analysis and a lot of other data research, which is happening. It's a long process. It takes like 20 years on an average. And a lot of that is being outsourced. Manufacturing of generic drugs is almost now entirely is, you know, like the India shares a pretty big chunk of that market share. Um, so that there is a pretty big growth in healthcare and pharmaceutical. Now, this environmental and social science, you know, one of the reasons which I found, I was talking to the union minister, the previous union minister of India, and what he said is like, definitely there is a big pressure on developing countries to reduce carbon footprint. And many of these companies where, you know, EPA compliance is necessary when they are operating in India, they are compelled to kind of, you know, like, you know, follow the international standards. And they choose to kind of, you know, like get expertise from people who have already done it. So that's where there is a plenty of scope for people who are, you know, like expertise, who are having the expertise in APA compliance and sustainability. Most of these contracts are, they are seeking actively people who have that expertise, um, you know, in those sectors in US. So I've seen astonishing number uh, of people who got jobs there. Now, social impact, you know, I talked about the lower half of the society, which is significantly large or majority of the people. A lot of NGOs, a lot of, um, you know, like people are making, you know, having their own products, own uh, projects, which they are implementing in India. And a lot of uh, people internationally are going there uh, to work in those NGOs. So those are the kind of, you know, areas which I found that, you know, probably would be of interest. Now, why would those companies, I mean, this is from your perspective that, you know, like, you know, like the companies are kind of what you are looking for. Now, what do company look for you? Company is looking at you and you get advantage because, you know, the curriculums in US particularly, uh, the in universities is very much kind of uh, industry oriented. It's kind of, you know, like the projects which you do and the kind of diversity I, I know. Um, you know, like my daughter, you know, she was doing her computer science, the major majoring computer science, but she was also doing microeconomics and mathematics and statistics. So this variety of different fields and the exposure where you can kind of tap into very unique uh, value proposition or industries, that's, you know, like a very, I would say a unique proposition, which is not yet there in Indian universities. Um, uh, the there are top universities which probably would rank you know uh, very well in these standards but those are very uh, proportionately very small numbers and most of the universities the rest of the universities are still not uh, compliant or align themselves enough with the industry needs so there is a gap and uh, definitely i can say with a lot of uh, experience that if I have to recruit a person here in US, uh, it's, there is a huge production, you know, automatic uh, kind of increase in the productivity of a US resource compared to an engineer who has graduated from um, probably like level two number, you know, university in India. So there is a big difference there. Um, other thing is like, 
students who are, you know, who have been here for long or who have grown up here, they have the exposure to very advanced and matured systems and processes. When they look around, you know, there is like, they have like a pretty good uh, exposure to many of these uh, systems around them. So that itself kind of, you know, like some of them don't even exist in India even now. So that kind of, you know, like is very advantageous because, you know, like India is still catching up. So there is a big gap between uh, overall ecosystem, I would say, where you can place your products and that exposure can help a lot. A uh, lot of uh, U.S. universities are encouraging innovation. There are incubators, there are accelerators, there are so many uh, factors which allow, and general, you know, like the founders of U.S. Uh, as a nation, the uh, founding fathers have really taken efforts to create a very unique system. And I've been in many countries, I've worked in U uh, European countries and I've executed projects there, including Germany and France and England. And uh, I would say that, you know, like uh, the business system, the economy, the startups, the success of a startup is probably, you know, like US has the best chance over any of these countries anywhere in the world, including, you know, Japan or Germany or any of those countries. So that aspect is kind of ingrained into the society, the, in the American society. And, you know, people accept new ideas much better compared to anywhere else in the world. So when you are growing up, probably people do not know that because it's always available for you. But there is a huge advantage of, uh, you know, like being here in the US where you can get that innovative frame of mind, which is not that common elsewhere because you know like the scope is very less and the chances of a successful uh, launches is less compared to us um, another thing is like us being you know like one of the wealthy nation uh, people are kind of in you know, the products are more towards customer centric you know they're looking for how i can make the life easy and <clears throat> how how we can make it better Cost is not always a, always a factor. So people are willing to pay for. General, generally, the in US population is uh, willing to change. They are willing to try new products and they are willing to try different things compared to many other countries. It's not like, particularly in India, now that we are talking about India, India still is a cost-centric uh, country where new products or services have to be tested carefully with the with the cost of the products and service because of the cheap labor, because, you know, some of the things they, you know, like if you say, oh, you can do certain things, they don't want to do things because those things can be done by, you know, cheap labor. And, you know, it's such a, uh, you know, like the, the factors of economy plays a card there and they are so cheaply available that they don't even bother to kind of replace them. Uh, subject matter expertise is again, you know, like when, the university courses here definitely take you to much better and deeper understanding of the subjects. Uh, and like that probably is lacking a little bit in a generic uh, Indian curriculum where it's more of an exam oriented due to the competition they face. Um, most of the students in India, uh, they have to really probably face tremendous competition, 100 times more than American students. Uh, so they tend to become exam oriented and and of course I'm kind of you know making it very generic so it's not specific to any individuals but generally people are considered the US students are considered to have a deeper understanding of the subject on an average but you know like that's that's a pretty uh, generic statement communication and critical thinking also uh, we have seen and most of the people I've talked to they agree that you know it's much better for somebody who's coming from Duke, but definitely they stand much better chance for a middle level manager at entry point and a senior management at a very quickly, they should be able to kind of play those roles because of holistic thinking and a very good communication skill, written communication in the whole value chain. So that's something which uh, kind of, you know, really attract me. Uh, I'm going to go with a few more chairs, uh, slides. Do we, are we okay? Do you want to have any questions right now or should I go ahead with my slides first, Nick? 
Are there any uh, pressing questions? Anyone want to jump in before we keep going? Okay, I'll, I'll continue. I want to also uh, draw attention to this particular forum. Um, this is pretty new. It's like Indus, Indus X is uh, has been launched in June 2023. It has a tremendous scope and I would like to specifically have chosen this to draw the attention because for the critical and emerging technology, both US and Indian governments, they are giving complete support uh, for the startups, which can be worked in a, you know, like for, can be utilized in the defense. And they are willing to give the capital, the partnership, the ecosystem, the um, accelerator facilities, there are plenty of scopes available, plenty of funding made available. And, uh, you know, this is something which you should really consider is that, you know, like a lot of technologies, a lot of people, the volumes are huge. You know, if you compare the US and Indian markets in defense, if you consider together, it's like one of the largest kind of uh, budget and a lot of new technologies, of course, internet has come from the defense technology. So um, I think like, you know, a lot of these things, which probably, you know, are developed for military eventually land up in uh, for the betterment of a common person. So this is something which you, you can consider and, you know, like there is a plenty of scope available for if you have ideas, if you have things to be done, you can utilize this and you can utilize all the rest of the factors which we talked about and then can leverage this to probably come up with something brand new which will change the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about some local success stories. You know, there's another uh, good friend of mine, you know, like uh, probably uh, the very handful few beginners, which I know, uh, who started this few years back here in North Carolina and went to India and started this plan. Uh, I visited this like just six months back, uh, probably. And this company, they have five huge factories now, uh, diversified and in doing multiple things. They have their goods available in, uh, um, you know, like in the supermarkets here. Um, in hardware stores. Um, there are 5,000 people now, 5,000 plus people who work here. This entire thing was set up in 1997 when China was in, at peak and China was like grabbing all the manufacturing jobs. That's when this uh, factory was set up. 15 or more engineers went from US uh, and kind of, you know, like did the design, they did the hand holding, they created all this structure and then kind of, you know, like did the training uh, for the workers there, the management there, they formed the systems. And this has been a great success story. Um, it's still, you know, like, uh, uh, I, as I said, I visited it with them recently. It's like an entire township and there are five big factories, a lot of people working there. I think the turnover, I'm not sure, but it is a combined turnover would be probably close to a billion dollar. Um, and this is in uh, the factories are in Pune, uh, in India. Uh, but the company and the you know the owner and everybody is here local in Triangle and uh, as a great success story for somebody who started their you know like the dream they implemented it in India way back in ninety seven and now I think like this become a pretty good plant and they are really doing wonder, wonders. They are supplying to Tesla, a lot of electric cars, components are being made there. A uh, lot of innovative uh, products have been produced in these factories. And the credit, you know, like clearly goes to the initial minds who shaped this dream. And they were all from Triangle, most of the people, I guess, like, but many American people went there and shaped this and did that. So this has been a great success story, which I know, uh, which has given, you know, from, if you consider it like, you know, 5,000 people are making their living because of what those 50 people did. And of course, we got a better quality goods here in the local market at a very competitive price. <coughs> this is another new startup. This is a, a, a Indian company, which has now opened an office here in Morrisville. 
and they are actively looking for their skill sets. So if you go to their LinkedIn page or if you can kind of find them out, it's like uh, Arapil Ras. That's the website. And they are a robotic company. They have created uh, uh, warehouse solutions and they are getting orders everywhere in US and they want to kind of, you know, like recruit people who can, you know, probably implement these projects. And, you know, like they can collaborate back in India. Uh, they have some of the clients in Latin America and elsewhere, but primarily they are entering here. And this is a typical case where they need like high-end people, high-end engineers who can kind of, you know, like would recruit or would like to recruit American students and probably expand their growth plan. There are plenty of things, you know, like where, you know, American students, as I described earlier, like, you know, they have the customer perspective, their communication is better. They have that innovation uh, mind. Uh, they have the holistic picture of the game. So much more matured workforce and uh, with a deeper knowledge, with sincerity. So American workforce, by the way, is very well respected all over the world. And, uh, you know, like everywhere in every corner of the world, um, it's highly respected, uh, the professionalism. So when you are kind of, you know, going from US, uh, the expectations are pretty high, let me tell you that. And people do get respect for for the work ethics and the productivity, uh, what uh, US workforce brings with them. So this is something which you can check out. Again, both the companies which have taken our triangle companies, one is like, you know, started in 97. I think this is, of a fairly new, like a year old maybe, uh, here in Morrisville, uh, in US. But uh, it's a pretty new startup and it has great potential. It's already doing 100 million turnover only in India. So they are expecting and they already grabbed, right, spoke with the CEO, they have grabbed many orders already, um, you know, which can kind of, you know, really potentially they are looking at a big market here in US and the products keep on evolving. So you guys can play a very big role. Uh, other things which I've spoken with my friends who are having business here, they need a lot of people in marketing and sales because of the knowledge. So they need business oriented management positions are open and they can pay the US salaries. Or you know, with the internet now, it doesn't matter where you are working from, whether you are here or whether you're going in India, whether it's a hybrid situation, you can explore it to you know the potential of American companies which are growing and kind of leverage all the advantages which India has to offer. You can do the partnership, you can have a startup. Uh, for me, uh, a couple of years back, I think three years back, I invested into a startup in NC State and um, we have a great success now. The product team is in India and the uh, sales and the idea team is here in Raleigh. And um, you know, like they have been growing tremendously fast. They are leveraging the cost advantage. We have uh, close to six people in Philippines also, and close to 10 people in uh, Pune, so in India. So we kind of, you know, like that particular company um, simply works. Um, uh, started just three years back here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, uh, they are leveraging both the US uh, uh, market as well as the Indian uh, labor, you know, economical labor very well. So there are roles which can be played as a bridge, you know, to take advantage of both these uh, places or advantages and uh, kind of make a success story. I think you, we need to leverage the resources all over the world to make it successful. So those of you who have startup ideas or entrepreneurship definitely has a tremendous potential and you need to kind of, you know, probably explore the ideas of how you can tap into these um, offerings which are provided by Indian market. Lali, thank you so much. Um, that is a great overview. I just wanted to interject briefly. We did have a, a question from someone in the chat. Okay. Um, so, so let's say I'm a Duke student and I, you know, I have a network based in North Carolina or the US and I'm actively looking for some opportunities in the US, but I'm interested in pursuing opportunities in India as well. Do you have any suggestions for how to get started with looking for opportunities and, and exploring pathways in India while you're still based you know, at school in the US? Uh, so uh, I think like my suggestion is just like in US, the, most of the job sites are same. You know, you can still replace the LinkedIn, you can search the jobs opportunities in 
on the web, I think Indian market does the same thing, exact same thing as that in US. Uh, there are some sites in India which are focused on Indian sites, but if you're looking for uh, good size companies, you know, which are multinational companies, they will be there in most of the places. Other thing I would say is like, you know, you know, just submit your resumes to the headhunters, you know, who are typically working for, you know, these kind of high-end uh, companies. Many of them, like if you are into clinical research and those kind of fields, that will be, <coughs> or medical advances or semiconductors, there would be specific names which you can easily find and you can look at their job sites. Um, I would say it's like as good as finding it in uh, in on the web, you know, like if you do the research on the web, you will be able to find many of these opportunities which are opening up. And if needed, you know, like I can definitely probably pass on certain resumes to certain things and investigate further in like what sector people are looking for and any headhunters or recruiting companies which are specialized in that sector. So that can be done. I think there are a few sites like LinkedIn, which are uh, probably common. Um, and yes, they can, there are a few more uh, local uh, Indian websites for jobs. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's super helpful. I, I was just giving some example, recent example. I interviewed a couple of students who recently went, uh, this, uh, this young boy went for, you know, he did his mechanical engineering and he ended up uh, going back to India and start his own business. Uh, he's into real estate. Again, infrastructure, things are changing drastically, as I said. So there is a value, you know, he was very enthusiastic. Of course, he has a family background. So he had a, a family business background or access to the capital. So he could start some of these ventures um, successfully. Uh, but there is there are plenty of people I met, at least three students, recently who went back and kind of, you know, like are working for their family businesses or uh, expanding on the uh, their own networks um, of the business and starting new businesses there. There's one more you know, young lady here. Um, you know, I worked very closely with uh, Ashwini. She is the one who kind of, you know, like brought in lot of design thinking into the product development uh, for us and uh, you know like she has been uh, a great asset uh, she was graduated here uh, in south carolina and has been a great asset for the product team most of the people the companies who are looking for product development they need you know people like ashwini they need students i would encourage them to definitely consider that because without having the deeper understanding of the psyche of U.S. marketplace. You cannot design products for them. And U.S. is like the main target. You know, if product is successful in U.S., the chances of making it successful internationally becomes a lot larger. So just wanted to give a couple of examples of real life that where we have some success stories in terms of uh, companies, in terms of students on both the ends.